This is the Tuesday morning session from the CB Northwest 2017 Annual Enrichment Conference, Beholding the Glory of God in All. Speaker George Verwer from General Session 2. And uh, we believe that your Holy Spirit is working in our midst here this morning. You know everything about us and you love us so much. Lord, I'm overwhelmed by your love and your acceptance. And I just praise you for the privilege of sharing here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you've been fairly uh, proactive, not as much as England, but fairly proactive in picking up books. Uh, by the way, 10 is just the initial get starter for the first night, just to see how the flow goes. So you can go back and pick up other titles, not the same titles. Uh, there's a lot of other titles on the free table. You can just go and take them really we'd like you to take them and give them to others who are not here and become a distributor of christian literature it just seemed to me such a natural thing to do started as a baby christian should i found the greatest thing in the world the lord jesus i should use every method to share that uh, with others i did want to however point the gold mine we have on the other table where you have to give a donation even a quarter uh, we are one of the biggest Christian book buyers in the world because of our work in India and the ships. And so we buy books at very low prices and we want to pass them on. You know, some great books don't sell. I've been reviewing one uh, this morning. I don't think one single copy has been picked up yet. I mean, why, why would you pick up a book about Buddhism? There'll soon be two billion Buddhists in the world. They are far more unreached now than Muslims. There's a huge wave of work among Muslims. We're in the middle of that. They'll have a meeting in Bangkok of over 100 groups working among Muslims. And that needs to increase. But Buddhists are a forgotten people. They're often harder. They're sometimes fanatics, like in Sri Lanka. And there's a book on Buddhism that never sold, so I bought out the remaining lot. I can't tell you what I paid, but you know, if you leave a dollar, we'll be very happy. That's a gold mine. Put it in your church library. Uh, some of you just looking at you from here probably are not able to read a book that thick. But uh, <laughs> you could put it in your... That was a joke, by the way. Please don't be offended. Just want to make sure you're awake. What are some of the other books on the donation table? I believe this is one of the most significant books in the history of the United States. Gordon MacDonald blew it as a minister, the number one minister in the East Coast. He blew it big time. It was front page news when it broke. Hallelujah. He was restored. His marriage is a beautiful marriage. And for the last 20 years, he's been an example Christian leader of a restored, forgiven, dynamic, godly man. He had already written many books. And now, because of that failure, just like David had, we have this incredible book. Rebuilding your broken world. You have people in your churches with broken world experiences. They must not give up. Maybe they're on plan B. Plan B can be as great as plan A because God is God and he forgives. Maybe you have people in your churches that are really zapped. They're on plan M. Plan M. Praise God for a big alphabet. Press on in the grace of the Lord Jesus. I'd urge you to pick up. It's mainly a Bible study on all the broken people because almost all the people you read about in the Bible had broken world experiences. So I thank God he's become a very close friend with the first group to invite him into Maine International Ministry after he went through a time of discipline. Thinking about marriage, uh, this, of course, is a brilliant book by famous Jerry Jenkins about loving your marriage enough to protect it. This is the first African-American to come on Operation Mobilization. We met at Moody Bible Institute. He only went to heaven a few weeks ago. An incredible story of a journey. And I'd encourage you, uh, especially to pick it up, maybe read it and pass it on to some other African-American uh, that you meet or maybe even in your church. There's the official history of OM. It's a bit long, and some people find it boring, so you know you could just look at the cover. And there's Operation World, became over in the last years the almost the most famous missionary book in history. 
prayer requests on every nation in the world. How many of you already have a copy of Operation World? Look at that. This is a cutting-edge crowd. We've got about 30% who know what's going on on the planet. This is so encouraging than the average place. And there's a chance to pick it up even for uh, a dollar. My book on messiology, which I'll be touching on probably tonight and tomorrow, uh, is there. The original title of this actually was More Drops, Mystery, Mercy, and Messiology. Messiology is only one of the themes. Like all of my books, it's a radical call to grace, and discipleship, reality, and then the messiology thrown in. Messiology is my own word. I invented it myself based on my own proverb. I've been writing proverbs. Uh, they're not getting in the Bible. I don't even know how to, like, apply for that. But uh, most of mine have not gone anywhere. But my most famous proverb is where two or three of the Lord's people are gathered together, sooner or later, there's a mess. How many of you have ever experienced a mess among the Lord's people? Raise your hands. That's the same survey all over the world, so don't get an American inferiority complex. And messiology is God's side. It's the other side. How God can work in messy situations. Otherwise, how do you explain what God was doing in the Civil War? With godly people on both sides. Harder than that, how do you explain God's huge blessing on white people in the early days of America who owned slaves? Or how do you explain God's blessing, enormous blessing, church growth, even revival among white people in South Africa who are practicing apartheid? God has a different way of thinking and operating than we do. We, of course, need to stick to our human limitations, walking by faith, trusting him for answers to prayer, of course, but we cannot put God in that same box. This has helped me with so much nonsense, 62 years of nonsense that I have seen among God's people and has just made me happier, more big hearted, more forgiving. And I've had hundreds write me after emailing this or reading this, email me and say it has transformed their life. A young man came up to me, the son of a rather interesting Christian leader whose family probably had suffered a little bit under him. And he said this little book changed his life. What an encouragement. And that is available for any donation. And then another one of my favorite books, if I said only one book of all the books I have that you should read, it would be this one by Alex Thronch on love or leading with love. And from what I hear, uh, in my short time with you, you're already into this. Your mentoring, your ethos that I connect, reading your materials, you're, you're already into this. So you will be wanting to get 100 copies, and I can help you get them. I would love to give a free book to everybody in all of your churches. If you think this guy is crazy, well, you're right on that point, but it's a positive craziness, crazy about Jesus, crazy about giving away books, gave away 100,000 last year. And I'd love to give books to everybody in your church. And all you have to do is email me, tell me the number, give me the address, and we'll send the books. And then lastly, one of the most encouraging persons in my life is the, uh, the president of Moody Bible Institute for a long time. And it's George Sweeting. He's way over 90 or he's hitting 90, still going strong. By the way, don't let that retirement announcement confuse you. That's just like about money. That's about technical things. That's not about King Jesus. And this idea that there's any retirement at all for older people is pure nonsense from hell. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, let's forget this hardball message we have and sending out missionaries who die on the field saying that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And now simply because we're older and maybe not feeling well, we're really not any longer hot and active for King Jesus. And I just believe it's a trick of the enemy. People sitting around Florida playing golf three or four days a week. I'm not against golf. I play golf. In fact, I've developed my own new high-speed golf. You go out when no one's there. You make your own route. And you talk on the phone. And you send, e no, not emails, but you listen to audio Bible. But I respect proper golfers as well. <laughs> moderation is one of my favorite words. There's scope for all kinds of things in moderation. But the end of the day, to live is Christ. To die is gain. The end of the day, it's reaching people 
with the gospel. And how sad it is, especially pastors, when they no longer can preach, they sort of shrivel. This is a trick of the enemy. You can talk to individuals. The Lord Jesus gave himself to 12 people. And you can always find people to talk to in our society, in the malls, in the parks. And now people are coming to Jesus by the hundreds of thousands through internet evangelism. From my laptop, I talk to people in over 100 countries. Now we have Twitter, we have Facebook. I put a little entry in Facebook, and the next day, 300 people have looked at what I said. I mean, this is a new day. How could you ever be bored in 2017? By the way, you've had the news that came last night. Facebook and Twitter and YouTube is going to merge. Bill, Dray Bill um, Gates is sort of opposing it right now, but I think it's going to happen. Have you had that news? It's going to be called You Twit Face. <laughs> you haven't had that news yet. <laughs> anyway, a couple of you look really serious. That was a joke, huh? <laughs> that was a joke. Also, the final thing on the donation table uh, is the film of my life story. If you could show this to your young people, you don't have to watch it yourself. If you could show it to your children, I made, this film was made by the Christian Television Associates and we aimed it at young people. It's fast moving. Non-Christians have rated this film quite high. Filmed in Nepal, filmed on our ship, filmed, uh, of course, quite a bit in England, filmed in Mexico, Madrid. Uh, so you can get it on this little uh, stick that, what do they call that, memory stick, and you can also get it in the form of a DVD. Turn in your Bibles now uh, to the book of Acts, and I hope you preach from the book of Acts. I know many of you are preachers. I got a whole series on Acts. I can give it to you on a memory stick or a DVD, and I just love this book, and I'm still feeding on it, still being motivated by it. And I want us to turn, especially now, to Acts 23. Acts 23. I've had the privilege of speaking to Christian leaders since I was 18 years old. I don't know how that happened when I was so young. But uh, God's people, especially some of them, they, they were willing to listen to a teenager who had a vision and who went to Mexico and who saw many people in his high school come to Jesus. And I, yet I still find it such a privilege uh, to be able to share with leaders, to pass on what I have received from many other leaders. If I gave you the list of 100 people, including Dr. Francis Schaefer, whose feet I have sat at and learned from, uh, maybe you would listen to me more than uh, me just standing here. So I'm not here... I'm first of here representing the Word of God and preaching and teaching from the Word of God, but I'm all, I have also received so much from so many great people of many nationalities. I've been in a hundred different nations, and I just want to pass as much as I can on to you. That's why uh, the books are my key, because our time here, of course, is short. And in the early days and to this day, God just often put it on my heart to speak on Acts 23. Pick it up at verse 12. This is about Paul. He was in trouble. He was arrested. He was going to be taken uh, to, to, to Rome. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests, and they, of course, did everything they could <clears throat> to take the life of the Apostle Paul, but God, through a young man, uh, rescued him. Paul was delivered. I believe there's a conspiracy because I believe in Satan. And I believe what the Bible teaches in another passage we're going to look at, and many passages, but we're going to look at Ephesians 6 in a moment. And I believe there's a conspiracy against Christian leaders. And I just urge, sometimes I only have 10 minutes in a meeting. I urge Christian leaders to be careful about their walk with Jesus. And especially to be careful 
what they look at, and what they feed into their minds. What you think can never happen to you can happen to you because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. What if you went back to your home on the end of the week, whenever you're going to get there, and there was a letter signed by 40 people. Somehow you didn't realize how many people in your hometown, including several in your church, actually hated you. And so they signed a letter that they're going to take your life. Um, probably you would think it's false living in our country, but other countries, uh, they would take that more seriously. One of our top men in Malaysia has had death threats for 20 years. He was abducted, abducted three weeks ago. He has never been seen again. Nine hooded men in the streets of Malaysia uh, abducted him. Pray for his wife. Pray for OM Asia, especially as he is one of the most well-known persons in our movement in Asia. Our present leader is an Asian, a Singaporean, very close friend of this one abducted. But here in the USA, that's not happening much, so you may not take it seriously. But if you did, certainly it would bring a little increase in your metabolism, maybe in your prayer life and other aspects of your walk. Turn now to Ephesians chapter 6 to pick up sort of on the inside of this reality, this aspect of spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter 6. One of the persons that I became a friend with in London that influenced me was a man named Dr. Uh, Lloyd Jones. And he has an exposition on this Ephesians 6 that I think perhaps fills an entire book. I especially remember when he uh, came to minister on our ship. Uh, people put Lloyd Jones in a particular box. He was quite reformed. And uh, he was quite sort of some ways separatist trying to get people to leave the Anglican Church. <clears throat> I think he changed and uh, renewed fellowship with John Stott later in his life. The two of them had uh, some conflict in a public meeting in London. Uh, and so he was a bit uh, criticized. Thank you for coming to our ship. <clears throat> it's just in the mornings. Some of you preachers know about it, right? Stick around uh, tonight going strong but I remember his message the word and the spirit in Great Britain we've had a lot of divisions in our church between those that emphasize the word and those that emphasize the Holy Spirit and Lloyd Jones took a middle road like operation mobilization and gave this and that message has gone all over the world he didn't release tapes in his lifetime he had a little thing in his head he didn't want anybody hearing any of his messages because he was invited to preach all over the nation. He didn't want anybody heard the message before he got there. But he gave me special permission to release that tape, the only tape before he died. And we sure circulated a lot of them around the globe. And I've listened to it personally a number of times. And the story of how he then passed on uh, Westminster Chapel to R.T. Kendall, uh, another outstanding man, more known though he's an American in Britain, then he would be known here. And his book, Total Forgiveness, to me is a must read in our society today. But let's look at these powerful words and allow the word of God to minister to us. And I'm aware that many of you have already preached on this text, but it still, it still can minister to you and to me as I read it. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. In our society today, this kind of thing is just considered like superstition or extreme. And I believe it will be more difficult in America and Britain and certainly in continental Europe to be a Bible-believing Christian. Let's beware of overreacting to that and get into foolishness, but I think it's a reality because the things we believe are quite bizarre, especially to many of our younger generation. And we're gonna need a lot more patience. And together with our strong teaching about faith, we have to be able to teach people how to handle doubt. I would not be here otherwise. I'm the grandson of an atheist. I think I've got his blood. In my first year at university, I almost completely lost the Christian faith. Very intellectual people had arguments that I could not answer. 
And there were books that were coming my way that just made certain sections of the Old Testament very hard to handle. How can we explain, and I talk about this in my new book, that so many men throughout the world, especially in the 30s and the 40s, who studied theology rejected the Bible as the word of God. It's not some kind of fantasy. There are legitimate difficulties. There are, there are questions that sometimes are hard to answer. Otherwise, have we, why have we just produced a book that thick, Difficulties in the Bible. What is that book about? The Bible, if we're honest, is a bit of a messy, complicated book. And yet I believe it's God's book. He gave us this book through human beings, culture, history. It's all there. It's not a tidy little somehow systematic theology book that some people put together in one particular culture and one particular language. And I hope you will stand. Whatever struggles you may have with doubt and intellectual problems as I do, I hope you will stand upon the word of God. I think you know the testimony of Billy Graham. There were two great preachers in the early days when Billy Graham was just getting known. One was Chuck Templeton, the other was Billy Graham. I actually heard Chuck Templeton speak after I became a Christian. Many believed he was a greater preacher than Billy Graham. Billy Graham had a crisis down in Forest Home Conference Center in California in which, despite his struggles and doubts, he decided, this is the word of God. I'm going to base my whole life on this book. Chuck Templeton decided a different route. He wanted more answers to more of his questions. And so he went to some more theological training in an incredibly liberal place where they'd already decided the Bible was full of uh, contradictions and inaccuracies, especially having studied the books coming out of Germany. And Chuck Templeton completely lost his faith. He, I believe he's a Canadian, at least he lived in Canada most of his life, and was a strong enemy of Christianity. By the way, a particular publisher wanted to get a, some bad stories about Billy Graham. So they went to Chuck Templeton about 15 years ago. And Chuck Templeton, though he was the way he was, he gave no negative story about God's servant, Billy Graham. And so the book they planned was changed to one more book that somehow showed the miracle grace of God in his servant, Billy Graham. Yes, I believe this is the word of God. I must take it seriously. Putting on the whole armor every day to stand against the devil's schemes. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. One of the things that's amazed me the most all over the world are the unbelievable number of splits that take place in the church. Now, if you take on my messiology theology, you can realize that God can work through that. But that's not plan A. And soon we have two or three or four churches that all came out of one church. It's wonderful when later on they're reconciled and pastors start praying together, meeting together. That happens. And I thank the Lord for it. But I believe a lot of the splits are based on the lack of basic spirituality, especially men getting into leadership, getting into the elders board and the deacons board. I know there's different styles in different churches. And somehow getting into those positions before they know basic spiritual warfare, basic spiritual reality. How can we have men and women leading a church who have not even got to the basic steps that I knew when I was 19 years of age? The crucified life, the spirit-filled life, dealing with the self-life, buffeting the body, bringing into the sub subjection, lest after preaching to others become a, rub, a, a castaway. And no wonder... We, no wonder we have so many messed up situations. Again, God overrules, God restores. But I myself, especially as a leader of OM for 46 years, I had to aim high in the kind of reality I expected in my leaders, the kind of families I expected them to have. And I've had the great joy of seeing so many who ran this race that we're speaking about here for an entire lifetime. What a privilege I've had of being linked with thousands of people 
for more than 50 years. You've got to live a long time to do that. From almost every nationality. And now through email, I can keep in touch with them and see how they're doing. I have two or three friends who die every week. And as much as possible, I'm there at the funeral celebrating what Jesus has done through these long-distance marathon runners who knew that reality when they were young Christians and therefore were able to live a life of purity and reality and honesty. And let's read on because every verse is important. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your, your feet fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The most influential book in my life is A Baby Christian. It was, of course, a book by my spiritual father, Billy Graham. Peace with God. It's such an old book, but get a copy. Peace with God. As far as I know, again, my memory is not perfect. Every day I've known the peace of God. Every day I've been at peace with my wife when I've gone to bed at night. And I've never gone to bed with anything ever against anybody. Radical grace and radical forgiveness broke into my life when I was still only 19 and 20. Books like Calvary Road, powerful messages by Theodore Ept. I was hungry for God. I was hungry for the word. I soon had hundreds of scriptures memorized, transforming my lustful mind, my impatience, and many other struggles that I had as a Christian, some of which I touched on last night. What powerful message from the Lord. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which he can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The word is out that it's impossible for men. It's in the sociology books. It's in the culture. It's impossible for men to live with only one sexual partner. It does give some credit to women. It says there are a few women that can actually do it. What a lie from hell. I can tell you I have many, many friends all over the world that have had only one sexual partner. We're not putting ourselves up at Pharisees looking at men who have failed. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here talking about radical grace and distributing books like Messiology. But surely, as much as possible, we want plan A. And in ministry especially, as a public person, it will be a mess if you commit adultery in your community. And so you need to have a plan. At 19, I already had a plan of how to deal with lust as I was still struggling with pornography. Even years later, as a Christian leader, I was walking in the woods of London. I'd been living a pretty, you know, victorious life in that area, praising the Lord, my wife as well. And here was an expensive magazine in a tree I don't think I ever bought such a magazine. I had been tempted, but I was very tight with money and wanted money for Bibles. And so it seemed extra sinful to me to buy this $15 magazine, things now that you can just click and get on your telephone. And my heart goes out to anybody battling with pornography, especially young people, because it's just 10 times more difficult. Often in those days in my dark moments when I wanted to find something, I couldn't even find it in our unique semi-puritanical culture of the 50s. And here this magazine was in the tree. Boy, how I just love to give you my victorious life testimony. You know, I just looked at the magazine, you know, just thought about Ephesians 6, zap in the name of Jesus. The magazine disappeared, and George Verver, the victorious Christian, to be invited to the next Victorious Life Convention, came out of the woods praising the Lord. How many of you prefer truth? Are you any into the truth thing? The magazine made a fool out of me, and I fell into lust for quite a few minutes. But I knew Jesus still loved me. Somehow I knew Jesus still loved me, though I had failed him in a way that in my culture, in my thinking, 
uh, really made me feel miserable. Isn't it interesting? We can commit a lot of other sins and we don't seem to feel that miserable. But boy, anything sexual, we really go through torment. I knew about 1 John chapter 2. What's the first goal in that verse? Sin not. What's the second part of the verse? If you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. Tie that together with the previous verse. If you say you don't have sin or anyone who says they don't have sin, they deceive themselves. Many of our difficulties in our movement, and we've had plenty pioneering now 60 years, is the failure to learn how to live with one another's sinfulness. We get unrealistic expectation. I'm doing some new Bible studies on that right now from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and it's just really, though I've read so much, it's really given me some new insight. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the man who left his little home down near my office in London and went back to Germany during the reign of Hitler, knowing he probably would be martyred, and he still went back, and he was martyred, but he became one of the great teachers of discipleship and biblical faith. And what I've been reading from him lately just has really surprised me. He talks about even uh, accepting the gift of disillusionment. People have left our churches, not speaking of your fellowship, but in general, people have left our churches disillusioned with what they've found, what they've seen. And here this godly man, who I think knows a little more than the average American teenager, talks about <clears throat> the gift of disillusionment. And I sympathize with all of you who are pastors and teachers in your churches because it's tougher than ever. Because they're listening to ministry on te in television, on the internet. You're just one. <laughs> You're just one person ministering in their life. And I believe, and I talk about this in my new book, we, more, we need more discernment and self-control in terms of what comes out of our mouth in ministry than ever before in history. One of the reasons I wrote this book, and I'm not exaggerating, is because for 60 years I'd seen so many leaders and people that I loved and respect make so many mistakes. One of my chapters is mistakes cost. Not just sin, mistakes cost. And especially in public ministry. Some of you have been around a while. Have you not been shocked at what some Christian leaders that you respect have allowed to come out of their mouth on television and radio and in the press, especially in the, the last year or two? It has just blown my circuits. What's coming out of people's mouths? By the way, people have watched the Queen of England all these years. She's had her 90th birthday. She's a very strong, committed Christian. And those who have watched her and studied her and followed her, she's incredibly active. She is the, one of the best examples of the world that there's nothing. Retirement is nothing. And as they've watched her and listened to her, they've seldom found anything ever unkind coming from her mouth. How are you doing? How are you doing? And I'll tell you, I'm so ashamed of unkind things that came from my mouth to my own wife. Not, not heavy stuff. And I was quick to apologize and quick to repent. And she was quick to forgive me. But you know, if those unkind things come out in public ministry, you don't always get to the people offended so that you can personally apologize. And people talk. And my heart goes out that quite a few people in surveys when they're seniors have become bitter hurt and unforgiving. One of the chapters in my book is that you don't want to get hurt, don't play rugby. Of course, I wrote the chapter in Wales. I had lunch with a Welsh pastor. And he told a story of a, bu a bunch of pastors that were together like this. And a lot of them had been through hurtful, difficult situations. And so a man got up and prayed a prayer, a very sympathetic prayer, Lord, help us. And all that kind of thing, soothing, comforting. Uh, and then this outspoken South African who was the guest speaker, he got up, he looked all these Welsh people in the eyes. If you don't want to get hurt, don't play rugby. And I want to tell you, if you don't want to get hurt, it's too late. You have chosen the wrong career. You should have been an astronaut. 
Maybe it's a lot better on some other planet. But down here, you are going to get hurt. You are going to get misunderstood. You are going to get criticized. And that's why I'm so strong about radical grace and the revolution of love where we just forgive and we go the extra mile. It doesn't mean we don't confront. But confrontation needs to be with love, not anger. It needs to be involved in a lot of listening. And I'd encourage you as leaders in confrontation to ask a lot of questions of the person first before you lay your heavy thing upon him. Because probably the whole situation is a lot more complex than maybe it looks on the surface. How I thank the Lord for this shield of faith that can stop the fiery darts of the enemy. But I thank the Lord just as much for the forgiveness and the grace when we do fail. And I've had the joy of seeing so many people restored to ministry and accomplishing great things. The years ahead of you, even after technically you have to retire from being a pastor or retire from a job where you have a clear portfolio and things are now more vague, you're, you're somewhat on your own, they can be the greatest years of your life. You can also have a second career. A whole army of people for 60 years, older people, have come on OM as second careers. A number of our ship captains, chief engineers, second careers. Your second career can be better than your first. It should be. You should be a little wiser when you're older, no? But watch out for the SSS. It's big time, and I've heard it's in Oregon. Yeah, SSS, Senior Stupidity Syndrome. It's growing very rapidly in America at this present time. Pray also for me. Pick it up at 18. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and prayers and requests. For this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. That's a big one. Do you have everybody in your church on on a list or in your computer, or your database. Isn't it amazing what we can do with the computer? My non-priority folder with 250 emails waiting completely disappeared. And I got my high-tech people this morning trying to find uh, this, this folder. So sometimes I, uh, I wonder what's going on when I click those keys. Verse 19, pray also for me that whenever I speak words, may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare fearlessly as I should. What a great passage. How many of you have expounded that passage in your church? Come on, raise your hand. That's encouraging. What about the rest of you? You work as janitors in the church or you... You have other jobs. I've got, you know, we don't want to put anybody down, really. But what a tremendous passage. And I so thank the Lord that even though I'm 62 years studying the word, 62 years preaching, that it's just, it's still so powerful. It's the word of God. And I can commune with God. And that he loves me. My favorite story, and you can you can use this story that is that has brought huge response among young people. It's a story of the thunderstorm. Probably you know the story. It's not copyrighted, so use it with your young people. Even the adults in this storm were really nervous. The lightning was just too much, and the thunder was too loud. And then they realized their little girl is alone up in her bedroom, a little seven-year-old. So, of course, they run up the stairs, and another clap of thunder, they expect she'd be hiding under the bed, the little girl was looking out the window. They said, are you okay? And she said, the big smile, there's another lightning. She said, I'm fine. I think God is taking my picture. <laughs> do the people sitting under you in your fellowships, do they have that assurance God loves them? Even when they fail, even when they blow. We were the first mission agency, and I know this might get me in trouble, but I'm leaving town tomorrow night. We were the first mission agency to, to recruit divorced people. And wow, was I attacked for that. I just couldn't see. When I studied 
even the great hymns about the blood of Christ and about forgiveness, how someone, because they blew it at 19 or 20 years of age, should therefore then be treated as a second-class citizen the rest of their life. It became very real when this very altogether ship captain I had for our first ship decided last minute to leave me. Just about to buy the ship, and the captain was walking out the door. So I had to go to our first officer. He was younger. He was a Norwegian. He had been a drunken sea captain. Of course he had been through divorce. So I said, Bjorn, uh, you know, you got to be captain. He said, don't, I can't be captain. I said, don't you know? I'm divorced. He'd been persecuted for years by his Pentecostal church in Norway for being divorced. And the gossip, and especially if he, like, tried to date another woman or something like that. And I said, Bjorn, show me a verse in the Bible that says divorced people can't be the captain of a ship. He never did find that verse. What a godly captain he was. And God, in his mercy and grace, gave him an incredible second wife, and he became the director of our work in Norway. They last had been seen dancing in heaven as older people who got promoted. I could write eight books on how God has used divorced people and even divorced remarried people. I know it's complex, and you have to work that out. It doesn't always fit into our box, but let me tell you, the God I've been studying for 62 years, don't try to put him in a box. You can have some basics, but be ready for surprises. I'm known as one of the few public speakers that affirms divorced people from the pulpit. Well, this is going to promote divorce. People warned me about that when I started this at 20. We've had very little divorce in our entire movement among our long-term people. We can have prevention and we can have forgiveness and grace and restoration all at the same time. Of course it's complicated. This is a complicated book. Randy Alcorn in his fantastic book, The Paradox of Grace and Truth, has also helped me and confirmed some of the things I was saying over the years that I felt were a bit risky. Praise God for how he can use weak, needy, struggling, struggling, yes, broken people to accomplish his purposes. So the bottom line, as I close this morning, please, please don't give up. Please, please stay encouraged. Please keep loving and forgiving and going the extra mile. Please keep dealing with the self-life. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth within me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these two great passages from the book of Acts and the book of Ephesians, which stir us, which challenge us, us, challenges us, and which causes us also to breathe in the fresh oxygen of your grace. And Lord, I just know you have your hand upon all those who are here. Much more than that, you have you indwell all who have been saved by your grace. And therefore, we have, we have the potential for godly living. Lord, help us to put on that whole armor every day and release that potential that every nation and all people, even all these Buddhist people, may hear of the Lord Jesus. For we ask in his precious name. Amen.